Welcome back to Small Talk. Well, back if you've watched it before, and if you haven't been, well, hi, welcome. Today's guest is somebody that I met first. I can't remember if it was in the late 1960s or early 70s. Um, I was living in Dorval, Quebec, and we met at a toy store, interestingly enough. And mm -hmm. um, we lost contact with each other, and he did a search on Facebook, and we reconnected. And I saw him when he was out in BC a few years ago. And it was a really nice visit. Anyway. That has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today. So here he is, today's yes. guest, Ken Ball. Hi, Ken. <laughs> Hi there, Nancy. Nice to uh, see you in this kind of special place you're at, your, your own little talk show here. I think that's quite wonderful. Thank you. I, I really enjoy doing it. I really do. Um, I just want to tell people, like, you and I dated for a, a minute way back in the day. and For a uh, minute? Well, you know, it, was, it wasn't very well, we long. We dated longer than that. <laughs> it wasn't very yeah. long. But you're like yep. what, six foot four. Uh, you know, I was. I'm smaller now. Okay, and I you was are, yes. four foot. No, I am four foot nine, but I was much taller then. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, let's let's get to the subject of your uh, interview today. You've written a book, and yeah. uh, first of all, why did you decide to write a book? Uh, well, the thing is, I had decided more than fifty years ago. I was trying to see where I fit in the world. And a lot of my friends followed the, the straight and narrow, you know, they got jobs, corporate jobs, they got married, they got a house and a car. And I didn't fit into that world. I was very insecure about myself, mm -hmm. had a lot of self doubts. And I, I was really struggling when I was younger in my 20s. And thought, well, I, I don't want that world. And, and I didn't have the confidence to join that world. Um, and I, I think there was also an, an element of the rebel in me. I really pushed back against rules and society's norms and so on. I really didn't like it. And I, I read like the beat writers, Jack Kerouac and others, and say, make your own world, your own life. And I guess the hippie revolution came along and I realized, yeah, they're saying just, hey, it's, it's your trip, do what you want to do. So I kind of got swept away with that. Um, but needed to make a living and, and decided, oh, I'll be a writer. And then, you know, I could use that as an excuse. Well, why don't you have a job? Why do you keep moving from city to city and you're, you're not settled? Well, because I'm a writer and I'm, I'm get it and getting experience. Uh, and then finally, I went to Toronto in about 1976, got an apartment, sat down, said, okay, this is it. This is where I write my book. I lasted one day and realized <laughs> well, I, this was just all an illusion. I was just doing it because I needed a front, an identity. Yeah. And instead, I went out and got a job uh, as a teaching assistant at a school in Cabbage Town, found I love teaching and basically, from that point on made uh, made a living as being a, a teacher and he ended up an ESL teacher and uh, traveled around and, and did a lot of things. So my new identity became, oh, I can be a teacher. Writing is just something I do as a hobby, but but I never lost that dream of uh, I don't know. It was just a need to express myself yeah. somehow. I have no talent in sports. I have no talent in music, no talent in, in art, but writing words have always been important to me. And um, so I wrote a lot of letters. So during that time when I was traveling from place to place, uh, I'd, I'd write letters and I'd ask people, my good friend in particular out in Vancouver, can you save these? I don't keep a journal or anything, but can you just save this letter? And I didn't know that later on it would have more meaning to me, but I knew enough to say, can you save them? And this friend, sure enough, saved everything I wrote. And I, through the ups, the downs, the travels. And then I guess during this COVID time with the forced isolation, I started thinking about those letters and I'd, I'd look at them and realize, you know, it, it just one day it just dawned on me, I've already written my book. It's, it's these letters that I've got. And so when I first traveled to Europe, 1969, 1970, 
I wrote to my parents and they were very pretty team letters because I wanted them to know I was okay. Don't worry. You know, I've left Lachine, but I'm, I'm fine. But the, my father was so proud of me for heading off on my own. He, he typed them all out and saved them. Nice. And I'm so grateful for that. And then there was a time when my sister was going through changes in her life and, and uh, I was too. And we corresponded by letters. And a couple of months ago, she said, you know, I'm cleaning up and I found this bag of letters. I thought, oh my God, that's the final piece. I have the letters from my parents, these letters from my sister sharing a lot of intimacies about, you know, my dealing with not being settled. Mm -hmm. And then his friend in Vancouver mailed me, sent me all the letters I had written him. And I'm, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of letters, 10, 12, 14 pages. Mm -hmm. And it all fell into place. And this time of COVID was such a blessing because I could just say, okay. And every day I'd get up and I'd read through and like, ooh, that's an interesting one. Oh, oh yeah, I like that one. And you know, when you're, sometimes when you're in a creative space, it's like the universe does give you what you need. It, it creates a flow. And I worked every day, hours every day for a period of about three months. And I'm normally quite scatterbrained. For some reason, I was organized. I had these things in order, in binders, in files. We used that one. And it just all came together in one big flow. And um, I like desktop publishing. I love computers anyway. I'm, I'm a, a Mac freak. I've, since the beginning of Apple computers, I've been involved and done desktop publishing before. So that was part of the fun and part of what made it easy too is I could do all the layout I didn't have to go to anybody for help I was doing everything and uh, in the end I ended up with a 400 page book of uh, letters intentionally put in random order so it starts off I'm in a, a track gang in British Columbia uh, you know working on the railway next thing I'm in Japan next thing I'm somewhere else and it just it jumps around through the course of my life so basically it's from 1969 to about 1985 that period when people wrote letters and they meant something so forgive me i'm going on quite at length well, what's your, it's your story so go for it okay well the other part about it is i recognize the value of letter writing before the internet came it's wonderful you and i found each other on the internet and i to, the, to this day i'm on instagram twitter facebook i'm just all over loving it but i also treasure the days when we only had letters we didn't carry cell phones if you got lost you got lost somewhere you needed help you had to ask for help you had to interact with people and um the times when i was lonely not sure what to do i mean i spent two years in a village in nigeria a small bush village. I was sick. I was lonely. I was going through hell some of the time, but I needed to share that. And it wasn't a case for picking up the telephone. You know, that didn't exist. Yeah. It was I'll sit down, pour myself a drink, and I'll write to my friend Bruce. He'll understand what I'm going through. And uh, even better, he'll save it for me. So that period was 1980 to 82, forms a bulk of the book. Uh, those are like minimum. 12 pages was considered a short letter, but you're describing the moment you're, you're in the present moment. And now with everything so fast, everything interaction, nothing gets saved. Everything is email this tweet that the sense of time has changed right. back then. It took time to sit down, to get out a pad of paper, to get your pen. And you were very much, you were in the present moment. And to me, this is so important to live your life in the now. And letters reflected that. And I think people, a lot of people have missed that today. So, uh, yeah, that's a part of the story. And then I guess the second part was there was the Europe trip. And then there was the two years in Nigeria as a volunteer teacher. And then when I really decided I needed to get settled and smarten up, I went to Japan. I bought a one-way ticket. And Japan was just the greatest experience for me. And it, it changed everything about my life. I ended up getting married there, having children born there. Uh, I ended up with a house because of my time spent in Japan uh, during the bubble when they had all this money. And that, that just brought, it brought everything together. 
And so up until that period, again, we're just at sort of the beginning of the internet comes into it and you can send email and that's when the letters stop. Right. So uh, all of that is gathered together in one book. And it was a, it was a lot of fun. I feel very satisfied. So what yeah. is the title of your book? Can you, I think you have a copy. Can you show? I do have screen? a copy. I can show it. It's called Waiting. Whoops. Can we see it there? Yeah, Waiting that's good. for Now. Sorry? That's yeah. good. Yeah. It's called Wait, Waiting for Now, My Life in Letters, because it really, it just consists of letters that I'd written during those, those days. Um, it's available. There's a company called Blurb in California. So if you just go to Blurb, B L U R B, it's easy to find. Um, and you'd find this one waiting for now my life and letters i chose the title long before i wrote the book because i was always back then when i was in my 20s wanting to write i, I kept well i had to wait for the right time to write yeah and now covid thank you uh, became the uh, the time to do all of this so yeah. uh, it's there and if you don't find it on blurb i have copies at home i'm i go by a, an online name called scarborough dude that's another story. It's a bit strange, but really that's a, online. That's how people know me. Scarborough, like the word Scarborough. Yeah. Dude, as in, hey, that's me. Hey, dude. <laughs> so if you Google Scarborough, dude, you'll find me and you'll find the book and so on. Right. Yeah, right. I'll have to get an autographed copy, of course. Oh, yes. Next <laughs> time I come through Vancouver, I have a copy set aside for you right now. So I was trying to show my thumb, but, you know, the whatever it's really know, interesting know. you know there's some things like i didn't know you were insecure like i knew i was but i didn't know you were obviously because those weren't things yeah. that young people ever talked about exactly right and uh, i also find it um fascinating about the writing because i know that it takes discipline to sit there because i've had a book in my head for a zillion years and i've started it and deleted and started it deleted it. never you know. got never got there one thing about the the letter writing like because I was never good at spelling, writing mm -hmm. was really something I never wanted to do. So when the email came in, I was just in my glory. Because now yeah. I didn't have to worry about being people correcting my spelling anymore, you know? It so, helps. It really yeah. does help. So it's it's so fascinating for me that somebody who can, like you, who, who appreciates putting down that written word. And, you know, and, and I remember you writing to, I was with my ex, Jerry, Jerry mm -hmm. Brown. And you were in England and you wrote to us and oh. I wrote back, but I guess I had the wrong address because you were complaining about uh, something about the toilet paper. So I wrote you a poem on a piece of toilet paper, <laughs> but you never got it, sadly, you know? Yeah. But really. I, I just think it's, it's so like to see each other now at this age, who we were way back then, who you were who you yeah. were way back then and to see you now you know this man with this this wife and children and you're, you're probably a grandfather I right and, and it's so funny because in the letters I'd be referring to that from my 20s like I never ever want to end up in the suburbs like my parents I never want to get married and have yeah. all of that stuff and here I am I couldn't be in a better place but life goes through these changes I want to pick up on the thing you talked about the insecurity it's the thing that drove me. I was insecure in my life. I, I was no good at sports. I didn't see well. I didn't know I needed glasses till grade five. And, and so and we moved a few times. So I didn't entirely fit in. And I grew up, you know, not knowing what is it to be a man? That's a question a lot of young men have. What is it to be a man? Well, you got to do this. You got to be this. You, you got all these things. And I felt I don't fit. And I was very uncomfortable about that but it, it forced me it's like johnny cash the song a girl named a boy named sue mm -hmm. his father forced him to fight by giving him a girl's name I, I sort of felt a similar thing happened i had to prove myself that i could do it and that's why halfway through university i bought that ticket to paris so i'm just going to go and travel and see what it's like i was going to go with a friend he backed out and i'm so grateful i had to do it alone and it was a huge step up for me. And life is always these series of steps you have to make. You know, as soon as you finish one, get over one hurdle, the next one goes, up, okay, you got to do this now. Yeah. And that's what got me to Nigeria. I was afraid of going. I don't fit in. I'm, I'm not qualified or skilled. I'll never last two years in a village, you know. Yeah. But it gave me the confidence I needed to move forward to the next one. Okay, well, what about this 
going to Japan, making a living there. Okay, so it's a gradual thing, but I think the things we're, we're dealt with, I mean, we all have our own challenges. They're unique for each of us. I, I listened to a little clip that you put up about being socially shy and insecure, and I found it so interesting because we don't know, we, we see the outside, but yes. we don't know what it is to be a person inside. We really don't know. Yeah. And we each of us have to sort of find our own way and, and uh, make our own challenges. And the one lesson we learned very young, anything you don't face will just get bigger and bigger and it'll never go away. And until you face up to that problem, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're stuck in a point. And then once you've done it, then along comes another one. Okay, smart ass, now do this, you know, and, and you, you're continually trying to be a better person, to fulfill yourself somehow, I think, anyway. Yeah, just realizing that, you know, I, I had no idea we had so much in common, really. Like, I never felt yeah. I fit in, and for me, it was more like with the family thing, like my sisters and brothers, like I was 29 before I had a, my first child. Everybody else in my family, most of them were that had been, you know, maybe late teens, early 20s, were in relationships mm -hmm. or married or had their children. And something's wrong with me, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Now, well, now I think, same. hey, I was just ahead of my time. That's all, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> yeah. nowadays people are, are having their babies, women are having their babies younger exactly. on the average, right? Um, yeah. and, and it's just like, Wow, we were we had this these in a, in a sense parallel lives, but living yeah. them totally, well, separately, and, and, totally different, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and we we just we're wired that way. We create these things that that to yeah. somebody else that's not a problem. I don't see that. I don't get that. But they don't know what it's like to be inside of us. Um, I went for I had a point. I was so low in Vancouver. Um, that I needed help. I needed to go to see a psychiatrist. My, my girlfriend told me, look, you're, you're, you're going to kill yourself. And I, I was, I, I was doing drugs and LSD is a dangerous thing sometimes or whatever you're taking. And so you get into these strange head spaces. And fortunately, the girlfriend at the time said, look, you got to get some help. And I went to, uh, to see a psychiatrist at the University of British Columbia. And he said, well, we've got just the thing for you, group therapy group program mm. and I'm in my early 20s at this point and I thought oh I <laughs> no way it's it's one thing talking to you privately but to sit with a group of people there's no way and then I knew right away that's exactly that's the hurdle you have to get over that's what you have to do and I went and signed up for this program out at um, University of British Columbia at the Health Science Center Hospital it was the turning point in my life of, of you know there have been several but this one meant so much because I learned one thing and the thing was everybody is fragile everybody is easily broken everybody is protecting themselves everybody is hiding their inner self because it is so delicate and it's so we're so easily hurt we're so afraid of being hurt too and then when I realized I met there were 20 people in the group and we had to sit there and you weren't allowed in to the group this circle until you owned up of who you are and they would call bullshit if you said ah, I'm, I'm just here because I just want to learn stuff no and you you end up in tears like you're just in a, a mess and as soon as you break down and cry okay you're in you're all right <laughs> wow that's strange and it was it was like a miracle cure I mean it took me a long nice. time I was here about seven weeks five days a week but it was that type of encounter therapy run by a, a Czech psychologist psychiatrist and helpers and it was just to say, hey, we're, we're all the same. It's the human condition to be fragile. And you meet somebody else who says, well, you don't seem that way. And everybody had their own secrets, alcohol. Can, but that was so wonderful. And today, I, I still try and share that with people, younger people. Look, you know, you're hiding, you're putting up in front because you have to, because the world expects that of you. But don't be afraid to open up to that inner self. Be fragile, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a good thing. It's healing to make you strong. Yeah, it's healing. Sorry? It's healing. It's healing. Yeah. 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 And That's I think we good. have to. Yeah. I, I think the other thing, the other, from a philosophical point of view, I think a lot of people just think they just take life for granted. Oh, yeah. I watched TV last night, did this, did this. And I think the starting point you need is there is nothing normal about being a human being. There is nothing normal. We have evolved from these creatures over life. Like that's, that's just a fact. We are not 
divine God creations, you know, fully intact. We have just grown to become what we are. And we're suddenly we're, we're unlike the animals We're we can reflect back on ourselves. We're aware of our place in space on the planet, in the universe. And I guess I, we don't use bad language on this small talk thing, do we? So it's a mind thing, you know, Yeah. it really, screws up. but that has to be your starting point. There's nothing right. normal about being human. Just do the best you can right. and go on from there. And yeah. then the second rule, make friends. Without friends, you've got nothing in life. Mm. And I think you're good at that. I think you have that talent. And I think you recognize the importance of friendship because that's the thing that'll get you through life. Yeah. Family to some extent, friends, I think even more so. And friends who you can trust and who trust you. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, well, we're yeah. getting uh, close to the end of the time, but I, first of all, I just want to... I bet you we are. <laughs> just to, no, no, it's been great. It's been great. I wanted to tell you something that, that you... Um, I used to be a reader, but, but yep. you, you gave me a list of reading. You were in a university, and yeah, you gave uh -huh. me a list of uh, suggested reading for university students. Yeah, yeah, and that just okay. really, really took off it with me, you know. Like I started reading books that would never have, you know, Mordecai Richler and J.D. Salinger, yeah. one of my 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 favorites. And it's just, oh, me too. yeah, I can't even remember all of the authors. But that was because of you. You gave me this list, and I went through each of those authors and read everything I could. And then yeah. I had reconnected with our mutual friend Bruce, and he told mm -hmm. me that I encouraged him to read because I was talking about the books that I was yeah. reading, you know? So how you passed that to me and I passed that down to, to him. It's so, I, funny. Yeah. It's, it's so funny, the, the synergy here, because for the past three days, I've been rebuilding my library behind me and it's those books, Salinger's there, and I'm going through one by one and putting them properly in their place. I'm a, I'm a, a pack rat in the sense of I collect things right. and I don't like so those books from university. I still have them. They're behind me now. They survive decades of moving from place to place and now finally i have a place a basement bar where i can display my library and i'm thrilled it just gives me so much pleasure to pick them up and find them and the trick is you know, finding the time to read again yeah because we've got the invasion of the internet and television and netflix and everything else but uh it's a wonderful thing it's being wonderful able to read thing. and this has yeah. been a wonderful interview and we're not in time fun. <laughs> yeah i know i well i knew i warned you i'm a talker you what didn't is? even ask me about my hat <laughs> oh japan, tell me about your hat. Keep japan hat yeah tell me about my, my hat. forehead was looking a bit big today so i figured <laughs> i needed that no this has anyway, been, it's been a pleasure nancy thank you fun. thank you for agreeing to do this and once again share it where they people can find your book and the title share that once again please remember scarborough dude look up scarborough dude and you'll find an email for me at dixtonjanes.com or whatever or blurb for waiting for now i'd be very happy to hear anybody's feedback thanks, okay Nancy. yeah thanks everybody and thank you for watching and i hope you all reach out to ken and get a copy of his book and i think you'll really enjoy it and thank you for tuning and watching the show. Hope to see you next time. Until then, peace out, everyone. A sense of community till the wax a place to be. A sense of community where you're free. Rolling through the mountains, rolling through the valley, rolling through paradise with me. It's multicultural, you're sure to see it all. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see. Come party in the park, go dancing after dark. Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see.